Welcome to 1991 Movie Rewind, the podcast where we watch and review every movie released in 1991, from the all-time greatest classics to the critically panned and everything in between. We will rediscover forgotten fan favorites and uncover hidden gems as we explore the depths of direct video Join us in our celebration of the fun, unique, and diverse films of this highly underrated year. This week, we watched The Terror Within 2. <laughs> joining us on 1991 Movie Rewind. The Terror Within 2 takes place in a post-apocalyptic world caused by biological warfare that unleashed a plague that wiped out 99% of humanity and converted some into dangerous mutants. David Pennington, played by Andrew Stevens, is crossing the dangerous desert on his way to the underground base in Salt Lake City where he hopes to find safety. The base has their own problems as their crew is in desperate need for supplies and are constantly under attack by the monsters. Screenplay by Andrew Stevens, directed by Andrew Stevens, and released on January 18th, 1991. So I know the answer, but have you seen Terror Within 2 before? No, I haven't. Had you seen the first one? No, have you? <laughs> no. Oh. I know the box art for both. Mm-hmm. Uh, which, <laughs> I don't know. The box art doesn't age well, just because it, it reminds me of uh, Goatsy. It, it's okay. a weird place to start, but <laughs> um, which wasn't a thing in 1991, but you know, late 90s, early 2000s internet, that was uh, it's like it's a reverse goatsy if anyone who's familiar with that. And if you aren't familiar with it, don't look it up. <laughs> um, but yeah, this is um, this is interesting. I you know when we when we went through and we're picking movies for horror month, which is what we're like in the middle of right now. Um, I don't know if I knew what this movie was more. I don't know if I would have picked it for horror month because it's more like sci-fi rather than, I mean, you have a monster chasing people and killing people, but it's yeah. still more sci-fi than straight up horror. Yeah. I want to see, I'm, I want to see something scary <laughs> and we haven't, <laughs> and we haven't yet. <laughs> I mean, but, people under the stairs at least had like creepiness to it. Yeah. Um, and popcorn was just like a popcorn was like an homage and meant to be kind of funny and yeah like a funny movie but an homage to the 50s horror which and i mean it has you know the body horror because of yeah toby the guy yep but i want to i actually want to see something that scares me Well, that's gonna be. I, I know. That's hard to do for any movie. I know. Honestly, for a, there, a, a lot of the early '90s horror, I can tell is just gonna be not great. No, yeah, you're gonna have cheesy effects. It's, you're gonna have guys in suits. Um, and this one, I think, took it one step farther in just the fact that they were so light-handed with everything that they did. Like, the monster was just sort of, like, gently slapping people rather than, like, putting, like, a full-on swing yeah, when he's, like, slashing Yeah, or actually him. wanting to, like, bite or scratch or something. Yeah. You know? Yeah, it's just, like, you could clearly see that they're trying to be as gentle as possible with everything, even when they're just, like, playing with the camera or something. Um, you know, if they're trying to disrupt the external cameras on the base, the monsters are just very slowly moving their hand over the camera um and they're like oh my god they're attacking us like yeah. okay cool sure why not and i think the first one the first movie because we watched both uh, the original and the second terror within the first one does a little bit of a better job of uh making the monster aggressive or and just angry. a little scarier looking too yeah and i don't know I'm assuming that, okay, it's a continuation of the first movie, but they kind of forget that the first movie exists. You do not need to see the first movie to watch this. If you, if anyone out there is curious and wants to go right into this one, like maybe you're a huge Andrew Stevens fan, which is possible, um, then, you know, jump right into this one. Even though he's in both, he has obviously more of a hand because he wrote and directed this one as well as Dart. Um just the, the opening sequence is like a, a crawl of text that explains 
the basis of the movie. What I just said in the summary is like, you know, biological warfare, released a disease, wiped out the population, very few people left. All the stuff that they established in the first one yeah. is right there. Um, but they also changed the name of the monsters, which was really weird. Because in the first one, they called them gargoyles exclusively. Yeah. And they do not look like gargoyles in the first one, from what we know as being I that. mean, in the face, maybe. But they don't have wings. or. Yeah, they don't have wings. They're not made of stone. They're like flesh and, you know, muscle, exposed muscle. Like werewolf, like a skinned werewolf. Yeah, yeah, because they have like the big, like, like out big jutting, sharp teeth, yeah. sort of like a piranha. So they don't look like gargoyles. And in this one... We don't it's just see like the monsters a, muscly a whole lot. Man. Like a yeah, skinned, it's like a muscly man, and then yeah. skinned man. Yeah, there's there's also like a half breed type of a thing going on here. And um, I think uh, before we yes go further, <laughs> I just said this in the beginning. Trigger warning: sexual assault. Yes. And animal death. So there's like a half breed type of monster, as well as what used to be called gargoyles, which are now called. Lucis, okay, which, so... which they claim is a freak of nature in Latin, which is not true. Uh, it does not translate to that. And the reason I know that is if anyone out there is like interested in some really passive aggressive IMDb FAQs, okay. check out this movie because like someone took some time. Like I don't know if it's just like a weird you know like a science nerd who really had some aggression towards this or just wanted to nitpick, but like. Mm it's very clear that someone wrote and answered all of the FAQs on this page in a very like weird tone. It's like, did David Penning, did Dr. David Pennington um, pronounce, you know, the, the name of the vaccine flower thing that he was trying to get from the cactuses? Uh, did he pronounce that correctly? No, he most certainly did not. It's like that type of, uh, you know, so like the weird. the person answering was the person asking? Almost definitely. <laughs> Most definitely, and one of the things is yeah. One of the things was, does Lucis really mean freak of, freak of nature in Latin? He's like, no, it does not. It's like it mean means light. Means like it's like has to do with like sporting or something like that. Like okay, sports and activity and stuff like that. Because so, I, I mean, so Lupin is like you Lupin know Lupin is yeah like werewolf. werewolf. Fish. So I mean, they c could have called them that. Yeah. <laughs> they did look werewolfish. <laughs> but I just found the FAQs like really funny. It's like, uh, you know. Can there really be, like, a family of spiders hiding in a cactus that would shake like that? It's like, no, this is obviously a hoax. <laughs> and like, it's just like, oh, my God. It's just, I don't know. That was, like, more enjoyable than parts of the movie, honestly, reading the <laughs> FAQ. Um, but anyway, they changed the name from Gargoyles to Lucis, which yeah, probably a smart move. They probably should have just called them Lucis from the beginning or something other than Gargoyle. But it's just another example of how the movie forgets that the first one exists and that comes into play much later in the plot with david and the way that he actually reacts to things and how he handles certain situations that he should know better because of what happened to him in the first movie so anyway getting kind of ahead of ourselves a little bit i think he's alone in the desert and it takes a long time to establish everything and they spend a lot of time in this movie going back and forth between him in the desert and this new crew, because in the first movie, basically his entire crew is eradicated by mm -hmm. this creature, the gargoyles. And so he's alone in the desert trying to make his way to this, um, to this new encampment, which was, you know, thousands of miles away or something like that. Yeah, it was the... a little over a thousand miles. Yeah. Like 1,300 it's a, it's miles. going from the Mojave base to Salt Lake City. So, who knows how realistic... So, Southern California. From Southern California to Salt Lake City. All the way up to Salt Lake City. Yeah. Even though both uh, bases looked exactly the same. Virtually. They updated it a like little bit. the rock bit. formations looked the yeah, same. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, the, the settings look identical because they shot it in the Mojave again. Yeah. So. <laughs> but they couldn't go to, like, Utah. You know how you... There's certain parts of Utah that has, like, you know, you can go to, like, the Yellowstone. Like, the, I know that's, like, mostly Wyoming, but I don't know. Realism is not this movie's... <laughs> I know, I know. <laughs> ...intention at all. And so they went with whatever would cost the least. Um, and I think we also see that when 
we first encounter the monsters yeah and like it's a a slowly slapping hand and then um one of the characters kyle is shooting at the monster (laughs) no bullets bullets come come out that we can see we can hear them but there's no like flashes on the gun it's there's like, no like yeah, ammo popping out. Yeah, a toy out. gun, and he's um, just kind of shaking it. It's like they forgot going, the did, 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 did. <laughs> Yeah, yeah, he's just shaking it, and you hear the noise yeah. because they added it in post. Right. But they didn't add any visual stuff. Right. In post, even when it's hitting the monster, you don't really see no the monster getting hit with some sort of bullet. No. Or anything. It was in like In a later air. scene, they had some sparks. Yeah. Later on, I saw some sparks, but in other... In the beginning. Yes, in that first first The first fight. time he, he, he fired the gun. The one that's supposed to draw you into the movie. Yeah. <laughs> uh, no bullets were coming out, and no bullets were hitting that monster. No. Like, not even... It was like being punched by air. I don't know. So that was interesting. That was an interesting introduction. Um, and, and it became very evident that most of the plot was going to be exactly the same as the first one early on. Um, yeah. Where you send out some crew to do some stuff, they die, they send other crew out, and they encounter the monsters, and then the monster infiltrates the base type of a thing. Um, and then, honestly, the crew looked almost exactly the same as the first one, too. Like, you know, they, they did dress it up slightly differently, but the makeup of the crew, like you have like the one black guy, yeah. you have the older doctor, you have you like know, a young hot doctor. Yeah, you have the young hot one. You have um, you some know, silly guy. Other random fodder who is there just to die. You know? Yeah. So like it's all the makeup is identical. And then you know the quote hot guy who's like Andrew Stevens, who's the quote hero. Yeah, who comes in. Uh, yeah, I don't think he arrives at the base until about two-thirds in the movie. I was a little... Okay, so he's been communicating with them since he left the first camp. Yeah, and his walkie-talkie got a lot smaller than the first movie, too. Yeah. <laughs> that's. I was a little confused, because I was like, did he already make it there, and he's doing, like, a run for that's them? That's what I thought. Um, yeah, finding supplies. the supplies or whatever, food or whatever the hell. Well, they say does. they need a constant stream of vaccine, which... Yeah. Uh, sure? I, I mean, I don't know. Like, they're, they're... If there's any, like, virologists out there watching, obviously you don't have anything better to do right now. Like, you know, give us some feedback as to how realistic... <laughs> you know, like, someone... Yeah, like, he's finding... they have people are like coming down with the plague yeah and they say in the movie that it could randomly happen that like you know basically like everyone's already infected and it could just outbreak at any time yeah it's like yeah like the walking dead or something everyone's basically. infected it's just like it'll happen quicker in others than other like in some people than others yeah it's just That's completely it's sporadic like or something i me. don't know um, but if they have this vaccine, which I think is just straight up wrong terminology for the sake of convenience for the movie, you know, it's just, it's medicine that's, you know, delaying and it. I'm confused. Uh, okay. So an outbreak. I'm also confused because they're trying to get ingredients for this vaccine. Yes. And then the young woman doctor, she's like, we're running low, but I'm like, there's only like five of you. Yes. And you only need the vaccine for the five of you. You can't get enough just for five people? No. So you got enough for maybe one to two people? Well, that's what that one key scene was before the hot doctor does it with the the guy with glasses that survives a little bit But then, okay. (laughs) Because there's two guys with glasses. One of them dies like instantly. Yeah, that's I was confused on which glasses guy was who i was I, like the all the guys looked alike we were like except for the old guy and then andrew stevens all there's the goofy guy yeah old guy andrew stevens then and there's a black guy because of course they need at least one black person who will die first of course and then you know they In both movies yes dies first and then like they also added a black woman yes. into this movie who dies second which no she survives she gets the plague. Yeah, she gets the plague, but she... Oh, she survives? She survives. Okay, I thought she died yeah, from yeah. the plague or something. I was like, oh, great. But, like, 
they do such a poor job of introducing the characters in this movie that we're you know an hour 15 into the movie and someone says a character's name like oh that's who that character yeah is. And so i'm like going back even to my notes and like the I, young hot doctor I, I didn't know who she was for a long time <laughs> yeah i had it like it's sharon by the way I, yeah but they never said her name <laughs> they until didn't say like her name for like an hour yeah and, and yeah. then I was like, I thought when they said Sharon, I thought it was the older woman doctor. Right. Who is Kara. Yeah, I didn't know who was who <laughs> for a really long time. And then I thought it was me because, you know, I was like half paying attention. Yeah. <laughs> but even like, though I was trying really hard to pay attention. But yeah, they, they don't say the names of most people except for David, who's like the lead. They say... Um, and then even the woman that he meets... Her name is Eric, because I didn't know her Ariel. name until until he was like screaming her name at, near the end of the movie. They do a quick or, introduction like, because when when yeah, Ariel yeah. comes into play, she's loose in the desert with her brother Aaron, which I misheard as Eric. But when I was going through the credits, there was no Eric; there was an Aaron. So, so I'm like, Aaron, oh, I misheard it. Aaron and Ariel. Aaron and Ariel, brother and sister, being chased by a monster. Um, David is able to save them because he has the key, which is. Uh, you know, the, the, he has like a dog whistle, basically, that he blows and will repel the monsters. They hate the sound and then they run away. So mm-hmm. John Krasinski is obviously a fan of Terror Within. I mean, yeah, I wonder if they know this. Uh, but he did obviously a better job <laughs> with The Quiet Place than this. I mean, a lot of the... So with like the first movie, like who wrote it? Did Roger... Corman write the first one? I didn't look it up. Um, no, I don't. Roger Corman just produced them both. Oh, he produced it. Yeah. I'm yeah. just, okay, it's Thomas Cleaver for the first one. Yeah, and then someone and then else, the like, worked on it and had um, a credit for creating the characters. like, the basis for it is very interesting because a lot of books that I like to read that are, like, post-apocalyptic are, you know, the one that I thought of when I was watching this movie was The Passage. Which they turned it into a TV show, and you watched it with me, but the one was... with uh, Mark Paul Gossler, yeah, and yeah, the little girl. I was thinking yeah, about that was, that was that was a good show, and unfortunately they canceled it, and it was they canceled it right when it was getting good, because it was when in the books it gets in good the at, books, at that yeah, because I read all three books and I was like excited, and then you know they canceled it. But it's sort of the same premise where it's like this virus and then these people turn into like, they're kind of like a hybrid of a zombie vampire that just Mm -hmm. takes over and eradicates 90% of the world. I don't know. That's where I thought, I was like, I thought this was going to go that way and it didn't, really. No, instead it was like trying to be like a mix between the alien and then maybe a little bit of the thing. Yeah. Because, like, okay, David yeah. Pennington's aesthetic is sort of like what we saw with Kurt Russell's character in The Thing, and he has, like, you know, there's flamethrowers that they use, so you make that connection, plus it's, like, infiltrating the base. It doesn't have the same thing where the monster can take over and shapeshift in the same way as The Thing, and that's where the alien comes in, where it's, you know, a base, and it's going through the air vents, and they have to try to find it and eradicate it that way but yeah it's, it's going for more of like that type of vibe uh but it just doesn't there's no tension there's it, it's, it's like, not scary because the monster is yeah. like this weak piddly little thing that's just in a big rubber suit it's just not interesting <laughs> they don't seem like extremely threatening yeah, what what's weird about it? So they come the only thing that's like threatening about them which like I was honestly like I even with the first movie, I wanted to give up because I was like grossed out like beyond when they actually show the monster like assaulting the women. I was like I'm going to I'm going to vomit. This is disgusting. Yeah. <laughs> I was like <laughs> but they don't really say the, uh, okay, the mutants were the people, when you get the virus, they turn into the mutants? I don't think so. I think So that... it's like a virus and mutants 
Yeah, I think some of them turn into mutants. The human beings in the world that are left are either getting a virus or getting killed by a mutant. Yeah, so like it's either that they caught the plague and they just straight up died, or they became mutants because of whatever. I thought if you get this uh, virus, you become the mutant. They don't seem to indicate that in the movie. I want to know the origin of these mutant (laughs) mutants. Well, just yeah, just like were they previously men? War, war based. Okay. You know, like um. Yeah, yeah, as far as I know, they're originally men that... It's not like they're alien creatures. Both movies say that there is biological warfare and, like, you know, countries destroyed and, civilization and unleashed these chemicals into the air that gave people a plague and caused mutants to form. Okay. So, but then, And then the only way they multiply is by assaulting human women... Yeah, because then... they're not going to go willingly. And evidently, we haven't seen any evidence in the movies of, like, female mutants. That yeah, that's what I was with. like. Are women turning into these things? They just use the women as the mothers to procreate with to yes. make more mutants. That's what it seems to be. Okay. They don't spend a lot of time that's on what... the lore. Yeah, I know, but I was getting, I was like, oh, so if you get the virus, you're going to turn into a mutant, and then when that, when the woman, um, what was her name, Robin, when she got that virus, I was like, is she going to turn into a mutant? Because I'm like, they don't show female, so all the mutants are male. (laughs) I guess. That's what I'm guessing. Well, yeah, I mean, it's really tough to know because they don't explain it, and they don't let the, they don't let it play out in that way. I think what was maybe possibly scary is that in the beginning when the monster is trying to infiltrate the base they shut the gate uh they shut the the gate or the hatch Mm. on them and the finger is cut off yeah and then the finger is being examined by robin robin the the one of the scientists yeah the the black scientist the person i'm not sure if she's black um person of color scientist Mm. um who gets the plague later on and um and then they just leave it out on the counter and don't come back to it and look at it. And it, like, grows slowly and sort of, like, regenerates and becomes, like, this big sentient blob of goo. That turns back into... Well, it overtakes Glass's guy because he's sitting there with the plague. And then it just latches onto him and basically absorbs his body, body. to become the second creature. Which was also half human, half mutant. Yeah, I guess so. I was confused by that, because <laughs> I was like, is that, spoiler, the baby that was uh, born three minutes ago that turns into, like, a full-on human man? Yeah, it's tough to know which is which, or but there's, there's two Or was it creatures. Glass's guy who got eaten by the blob finger? <laughs> yeah, there's two creatures that appear at the same time. So, okay. So, Ariel, which we started talking about and then went on a huge tangent... Um, mm-hmm. She's loose in the desert, um, and God, it's so stupid. This movie, <laughs> this movie is so stupid. Um, so she's being attacked uh, by the monster. Gets like slightly attacked by him. Um, the brother is killed, and then David is able to save her with the dog whistle, mm-hmm. which he never tells Salt Lake City base is a way to repel them. He's in constant communication with this base, and not once. He's like, in the time oh, he's on I the found field. a way. Like, like, wouldn't yeah. that... Hey, high-pitched noises scare them away. So find something find and some do it. find some high-pitched whistle. Yeah, doesn't tell but them. But that was... Uh, wouldn't he... I don't know. Once he gets to the base, he should have been like, hey, let's blow this whistle and eradicate... Right, the speakers. Yeah, all... Because they can't hear that whistle... In the inside, they can just blow that whistle so the out, the exterior of that base can repel these monsters for, I don't know how many feet, but at least it will repel them from coming into their base, like, forever if they just played a high-pitched whistle Yeah, but by the time he's there, it's too late, because you got Goopy Monster who overtakes um, Jamie, who is the second glasses guy. Um, And then... He brings in Ariel, who is carrying the monster, which he should have known was carrying the monster. 
Yeah, he should have known well, he since definitely because that happened to his girlfriend in the first movie, which was ugh, what? How many months or days right. or weeks later was that? Yeah. So I'll, I want to get into that in a second, but going back to the original, like you know, saving Ariel scene, right? Mm-hmm. Like, um, there, there's a potential that she was assaulted by the monster at that time. She was definitely attacked, but yeah. we don't know if she was impregnated by the monster. Um, but it's possible because shortly after she's rescued, she says, "I think I'm pregnant." Like within a couple of days of meeting him. But- they they also do they it in also that time. sleep but together but it, it, it seems the next as if... morning she's like i'm pregnant and he's you can't know that is too soon but he's super happy and he's like yay yeah literally the next day after they wake up from sleeping together she she's like i'm pregnant how would you know after conception Unless it's the alien's baby, which we know from the first movie, grows super, super fast. Yes. So that's that's my thought process. And that but, should have been David's because he experienced this bullshit. <laughs> right? Yeah, he already experienced this in the first movie with his... His girlfriend went through the same thing. Yeah. From the first movie. And then sort of fast forward, we're going to sort of skip a scene. When they arrive to the base, David is there. And Ariel's now fully like nine months pregnant. And he says it's only been a couple weeks that they've been traveling together to get to the base. So at that point, he definitely needs to know, just remember, remember a couple months ago, guy. But, These babies grow at an escalated rate. But, okay, so. But he's like, oh, I think it's mine. It's mine. He saves her. He saves her. They spend like a day or two together. They sleep together. She wakes up. She's like, I think I'm pregnant. But then they come across this, like, cult Yes. people. Yeah, there's other evidence that proves that it should not be his baby. Yeah, they come <laughs> across these group of groups or a group of people where they're like this weird-ass cult or something. And they seem as if they're going to help them, but, you know, they... David, I think he's like, I'm going to go look for stuff for the vaccine, I think. Yeah, so, um, yeah, they come across this group of scavengers. Yeah, um, they turn out to be in some weird culty thing. Which, yeah, Ariel is, like, already, like, apprehensive about it. He's like, oh, my God, scavengers, let's avoid them. And David is just super trusting and, like, He's smiling like, no, all the time. there are other people, they're going to help us. And sh- they go into their little lair. I don't yeah. know. <laughs> yeah, because they ask the scavengers, and, like, we need this plant. Do you know where we can find some? Mm -hmm. And they're like, yes, come back to our encampment, spend the night, we'll go out tomorrow and get it for you. Yeah. And so that's like the plan. Um, And when they're there, they run into Elababa, Elaba, Elaba, uh, who is like the the scavenger leader slash sort of like voodoo witch type of a character lady. Um, Like a sorceress. Yeah, yeah, like a sorceress type of a deal. And they have like this big old colony too like they're always prior to this in both movies they've always been surprised when they come across like, three humans. or four people yeah. in the same spot because you know it's just not possible for people to survive in this environment and here's this huge ass colony of people and david doesn't seem to give a shit he's not radioing for salt lake city and say hey guess what we found a whole bunch of people here who are surviving and thriving let's you know nothing mm-hmm. <laughs> right but but they uh, go there, with, yeah. Uh, and, and we haven't mentioned Butch either. No, point. we haven't meant Butch is the best thing in this entire movie. Butch is uh, like a pit bull, I think. Like, yeah. Like pit bull. Yeah. Dog who's been accompanying David since the first movie uh, has been surviving and a lot of Butch has trials been trials and tribulations. Yeah, Butch has been through some stuff in the first movie. He gets sort of attacked and that's when david uh he blows the dog because that whistle he has is for butch his dog whistle to call to come to him to call butch to come to david yes and in the first movie butch is almost getting attacked by a gargoyle i guess and um the gargoyle kind of you know scratches him or something yeah 
It definitely hurts him. It really hurts him. And then you think he's dead, but um, David blows the dog whistle, and that's when the gargoyle runs away. Cause that, and then that's when David finds out, oh, this high-pitched noise... It doesn't kill the gargoyles. It, no, just it just repels them. Repels them. So then he saves Butch, and Butch is okay. Thank God in the first movie. Uh-huh. And then we see Butch in the second movie, and I'm like, "Yay, Butch!" Yeah. I'm like, Butch is still alive. And it looked like a different dog, but it is the same. It dog. was the same dog, and it it's Andrew Stevens' actual dog named Butch Stevens. Mm-hmm. Uh-huh. And I don't know, R.I.P. Butch, because I mean that was 30 years ago. So yeah. But we'll see Butch again in the podcast. Mm. Okay. <laughs> He's going to be in Night Eyes 2, which is something oh, that Butch. Andrew Stevens also worked on. And okay. Stars and whatnot. So, anyway. Um, so, yeah, Butch is a lot. Butch so has come it's along. It's those three in the encampment. Yeah, yeah, so Butch has come along with David everywhere. When Wherever David goes, Butch is there. Except this one time where. He goes with these scavengers to right. go get this plant. Yeah. And because so Butch, Butch is staying... To protect Ariel, Ariel yes. Because at this point, she's like, I'm pregnant. Even though she's like two days pregnant. Mm-hmm. As we thought. Or mm-hmm. may know by now. Right. Time is not very evident in this. Because yeah. we didn't know how long they'd been walking until they arrived. And it's like, oh, it's been a couple weeks. And yeah. That's when you see Ariel like... With her big old belly, like nine months mm. size belly, and he says it's been a few weeks, and that's their only clue as to how long they've actually been out there. Yeah, and while David is out with these other scavengers to get this plant, the other scavengers of this culty group take Ariel, and they sadly kill Butch, which ruined my day. Yeah. Yeah, we were hoping that it would be um, thought, similar to the first movie. Where yeah, where he like... may have gotten wounded, but then Butch saves the day or something. Right. But nope. No. And then they take Ariel to this cave where I guess that's where all the monsters stay. Who the hell knows? I don't or know. The, they do some Alaba ritual. Knows. Yeah, the lava knows. And they do some ritual with her, which I was like, what the hell? They sort of explain it as that, like, they present, in essence, a sacrifice to the creature. So yeah, they'll leave the scavengers alone. So they'll leave alone. them alone. They're like, we let. But why did she have to How do. do you, so, yeah, but why did this, she have to do this chant? I don't know. That's what I was like. What is this chant? Like, just. If you want to do a sacrifice, just th- throw your sacrifice into the cave and go. You don't have to say all this, like. Unless they found a way shit. to, you know communicate with these creatures because obviously they have to some degree where they can work out this deal right? <laughs> that they're so, speaking their language yeah like they found their language and then whatever it is in their language they're like okay we'll give you women i yeah, guess here, here's the woman so they tie ariel up on this rock they say this chanty thing and then they leave and then this monster comes out from the cave and meanwhile david is like getting his ass beat by the other scavengers but he, he fights back and he puts, he, and one of them falls on the cactus with the spiders inside and he and just sort of spiders, the tarantulas go after yeah, him. Yeah, a bunch of tarantulas crawl on him and he dies. But that's a hoax. That is a hoax. According to spiders that IMDb not. guy, spiders <laughs> cannot. He said maybe a scorpion, like a single scorpion could be one in there, but not, but not a family of spiders shaking the cactus. Mm. That is a hoax. <laughs> I don't know. It's just funny. And yeah, so and then David is he goes back to the camp, he sees poor Butch dead. Well, here here's the stupid thing that I Okay, so he gets attacked, right? He fights back and he beats them and basically like kills the both of the, the scavengers who are beating David up. Yeah. And then before he goes to check on Ariel and Butch, yeah. he collects the fucking shit. He still like spends time to collect yeah. his little vaccine parts. He's like Oh, I'm, I'm, well, because he's it's like, like oh, I came here. here to get this stuff, so like, I might I as well take it. Okay, I understand that it's important, but at the same time, like, if you know that you were just in danger, you could make the assumption that your, your lady girlfriend friend. and your dog might also be in danger, 
come back for that shit after you've handled yeah, them. But he's like, I might as well do it because I'm here. Yeah, so let me thing. spend 20 minutes and do this and then I'll Put go it off. Put in and... certain vials and shit. Because they, they have all the other base ingredients, but they needed they this piece this of plant. the plant. Yeah. Which uh, FAQ guy says he does not pronounce correctly. Um, clearly, Andrew Stevens did not take the time to research how to say these things before starting the movie. Um... <laughs> Uh, and then, yeah, he finds Butch, um, and then... He finds Butch find, and dead, and then Ariel's missing. Ariel, uh, but after running into El Abba and, like, killing a couple of those guys, too. Mm-hmm. El Abba and one of the henchmen, when she's like, oh, it's too late, she's already been sacrificed, ha ha ha. Yeah, it's too late. He goes in to save Ariel, and then that's when she's being... Like, this is disturbing to me. I'm like, please, if... I don't know. I was like, please kill me. Because I don't want to see this. But she's being, like, assaulted by this monster. Like, you see him, like... Ugh. Yeah, you see him... Taking her underwear off. I'm like, ugh. Yeah, you see him thrusting and whatnot. I'm like, this is disgusting. From behind. And... (sighs) Like, uh, David comes in, like, at the... During that, and um, Ariel somehow frees herself. She has, like, a machete all of a sudden. I was like, where'd she get this knife? Unless, the, unless like, he was able to give her something... Um, like, throw it to her? Because he shoots the creature with the crossbow arrow. And like maybe he, she was able to. Get, Why didn't I he forget, blow I, I the whistle to like tell him to stop or whatever? I don't know. Uh, he, I don't know. There, there's ninety nine. There, there's a lot of stuff that just doesn't percent make of the sense time he should have just been blowing the whistle to get these monsters away. Yeah, and they also know that like virtually all ammo doesn't work on these creatures yeah you can shoot them and shoot lasers at them and they regenerate because we see that in the first movie i don't yes we do i don't know how many of the characters saw it but But they basically see oh yeah i think they did because they they basically like um because they shoot them and they set them a um a gargoyle on fire and then he he comes back together sort of like he regenerates the t1000 yeah yeah he like sort of like his his stuff regenerates and then we start to see it in the second one with the finger although everyone's oblivious and they just leave a fucking open biological specimen these people don't know on the counter this camp and never come back like days later and guess if you're like a true scientist you're checking up on your specimens like all the time aren't you i don't know especially if what you noticed in the seconds that you spent on it was that hey there's still moving cells inside that's what they said and yet you know oh Time for we dinner. We should be yeah. We should be monitoring this like on an hourly basis or something. But then yeah, it's just like okay, it's time for dinner. Okay, and then he just leaves it there. She Robin just the leaves open. it there, and they never come back to it. The they don't like time. isolate it or anything until it becomes this big giant blob that takes over um, second glasses guy Jamie. The only way to really kill these things is to really like chop its head off. Or there is one part where someone rolls a like a really heavy rock over one and pretty much smashing his entire body yeah but we don't know if that's permanent because they they leave in both of those cases right because if a finger can come back and eventually take hold of somebody if you leave but it's it like underneath time, this big rock is it just going to regenerate underneath the rock maybe I don't All know. Right, like, so you can why wouldn't just, it? Why wouldn't it ooze okay. out from underneath the rock and just so then go he can else? regenerate if his head is being chopped off? Then, then he whatever's could, left, the rest of his body could come back to life. It could become two things. It could be like yeah. a worm and just regenerate the parts of the body they're missing. They don't explain it fully. If a finger can become a human, like an entire like six two human being, exactly. human slash monster being i don't know exactly then why waste your time with guns and crossbow uh, bullets, which you if know if i was living in this world i'd be like just kill me please i'm i don't know i'm done yeah it, it's not a very um sensical yeah post-apocalyptic movie there's no real good end game in this 
Um, even at the end, when they think they have defeated the monsters, <laughs> both oh, yeah. of them, they just sort of like leave them in the open room um, and, and go then about walk their away. day. They're just like, oh, we're done with roll. that. Yeah, we're done with that. The end. Like, don't try but... to, you know, carry them outside or, like, you know, burn them. Or they've shown that they have a machine where the dead people can be put inside and evaporated. Right? We've seen that yeah, in, in this the, movie. In the first movie, at the end, they show them blowing up, like, three gargoyles. And they're like, yay, we killed them? But I was but like, that's just... they blew up the entire base at the same time. Yeah, they blew up their base and then three monsters. And then they were like, yay, we killed the monsters. I'm like, you have millions more, maybe? Yeah. To kill? You just killed the three. Yeah. But I'm saying in this one, like, when First Glasses guy died... Yeah. And the guy, uh, the black guy who was there to just be the first guy killed died. And they brought him back. Or I, maybe they didn't bring him back. I don't remember. Anyway, there's two bodies in this little yeah, transporting machine. First thing. glasses guy is Kyle. Second glasses guy is... No, Kyle's not first glasses guy. Kyle is Robin's boyfriend. Okay, I thought he was Chip first Venere. glasses. <laughs> He's first no, glasses no. guy. <laughs> Kyle is the guy who's shooting the gun with nothing coming out. Yeah, yeah. I, I thought he was first glasses guy. No, he doesn't. He doesn't have glasses. Oh well, they all look honestly. <laughs> okay, two glasses. I think, I think guys, first glasses guy is named Phil. First glasses guy, second glasses guy, and Kyle all look alike. Except Kyle has like cross eyes, big ass hair. He's sort of like um, Eric Estrada with bigger hair. He's, you know, uh, he's he's like one of the main characters in the movie. He, I mean, but yeah, whatever. Anyway, uh, you're just kidding. The, I the, know. The, the main thing is, like I said, they have two bodies that they put into this machine. They press a button and they just disappear mm -hmm. right into wherever. The first base did not have this technology. And then at some point, hot scientist yeah. is asked to be killed Uh through the same mechanism so let's load up these freaking things or try to lure these creatures into this thing which you can then just boop evaporate didn't didn't do that didn't think of that the entire movie yeah so dumb okay we and then we need to talk about the um the technology that they have because when ariel comes when they david <laughs> <Yes>. <laughs> david and ariel come to the base she's like nine months pregnant already yeah after a couple weeks after a couple weeks and he's cool with it yeah it's clearly my baby yeah he's yes all, i he... literally saw her being assaulted by a monster and, and he's yes still... i know what happens because i saw in the first movie yeah but yeah it's my baby so they do a test on her, like a blood test. I don't even know. Who knows? And <laughs> this was the dumbest thing. Uh, so they show on a screen <laughs> her egg. This is pre, like she's already nine months pregnant. She's mm -hmm. got a baby in her forming and it's like already <laughs> fully formed, I guess. But they do a test on what her body was before or during it was conceiving, I guess. Because it shows her egg on a screen and it shows a little sperm going into it. And they're like, oh yeah, that's your sperm. Yeah. David, that's your sperm. So yeah, it's your baby. Yeah. But then like two minutes later, a mean looking sperm flies through into her egg. And they're like, wait, what is this? Yeah. Oh, now the baby's mutating. So, yeah, what they did was they did the test that taps into the security camera that's in every woman's uterus, right? But, but, <laughs> and, then they, and then they looked at the historical footage. But they looked at her... They just heard on the tape in her uterus. Like, the, like everyone has. I was like, how... What type of technology can look at, like, the actual point of conception of a baby, like, happening? I don't... Yeah, like... It sperm like hitting this, egg historical animation that they're able to view and they were like oh okay it's your baby but then wait a second it's also not your baby because when she was assaulted like i don't know a few days later that mutant the monster sperm took over your sperm yeah <laughs> and now she has like a mutant half human half monster baby yes in her yes and then, like, it's not the so, 
Yeah, not so long after. Yeah, and then they don't even say what year this is. They no, don't say like how don't. many. I wish. I wish. Mean, what if it was like twenty twenty one? I know. And then, um, not long after that, she is. Giving birth. Gush, yeah, she's 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 in pain, and all of a sudden you just see blood coming down her legs, and she's about to give birth. Yeah. And yeah, she gives birth to this half human, half monster baby, and <laughs> and then a couple hours later, it's a full hours, grown man. Yeah, but we don't see it grow into a man. No, because this that would is require more of a budget and multiple stages of like the creature. Mean, that's when, meanwhile, you see the finger forming into this blobby thing, taking over Glasses guy. Yeah. So they leave this poor Ariel on the bed who just gave birth. And they're like, oh, we got to go check out what's going on in the other room. Mm-hmm. <laughs> I just, I was like, okay. They're like, oh, just stay here. She's like bleeding. And then <laughs> she just gave birth to a monster baby. Yeah. And, and again, David knows how fast these things can grow, and he just yeah he knows it. from the first movie. And that... then they just leave it in a case. They don't leave her with any sort of protection. It's cool. It's fine. I don't. There's there's a lot of um. So they yeah they see well they go and see glasses guy and he's a full on skeleton. His. Body. Yeah, yeah, like all of his flesh and organs his, have been absorbed. Like the blob by this took blob. over his body and absorbed his body, and then it's just he's a skeleton yeah, he <laughs> on t- on a gurney. Did not need the the bones part. It'd be funny if they left the glasses on the skeleton. Yeah. <laughs> so the blob took his. It would have been glasses. funny if like the monster was just wearing glasses. So you yeah, know who so was we can know who what monster was what yeah because i didn't know who was the baby monster and then who was the blob monster because that part they kind of like reminded same. me of like you know gremlins and how they replicate so you know like yeah. make it like gremlins 2 which didn't exist at this time yet but you know and have like multiple you know have have different variations on the gremlins so we know who's who i mean, it's i think andrew stevens was trying to be serious in this movie and <laughs> i don't no. know if that's true I don't. honestly just based off if of his he's body gonna go work full overall, on like buck wild i don't know i think he's like really silly just... then it would have been funny if that blobby thing was wearing glasses yeah yeah i don't think he was trying to go silly but i don't think he was trying to make like a you know like a serious yeah i don't think he was trying to make like a, a an opus type of you know what i mean like he wasn't trying to go for a masterpiece he's he, his mo seems to be churn out stuff that can be cheap and possibly profitable um but yeah like even when they're attacking things like it just doesn't make sense you know there's one point where um the monster is grabbing david and like choking him out or whatever and he reaches behind him and he grabs like this electricity source mm. and then he just like stabs the monster i think that's like right at the end what what basically like, kills the monster it's, yeah but but even though like hot doctor hot scientist had like shot him with electricity before and it didn't have an effect uh but anyway like, david what, is like yeah we don't know what really affects this monster you can shoot at it and then throw like lasers at it or whatever. Yeah, you can shoot it with lasers and stuff, which they do. And and they, they can do flamethrowers. Flamethrowers, yeah. Do anything. And it still comes back. But if you take electricity to it, it's I don't I don't I just understand. don't know how he didn't also get electrocuted because he's actively being held by the mm, monster yeah. at the same time, but the current only went I was through just, the monster. I mean constantly like where is the whistle in the, all of this? Uh, he gave it to... That older woman. Kara, yeah, the older yeah. doctor. Uh, by the way, and played she's... by Stella Stevens' his mom. Andrew Stevens' his mom. Uh, Stella uh. plays the doctor, um, who's an established actress in her own right. We'll get into that. Um, but they don't have multiple whistles, and at some point she's killed. She so probably the whistle, the whistle is in that room with her, or them, whatever happened there. Uh, but if you really want to go with IMDb FAQ guy, oh, all right. <laughs> uh, they shouldn't even have the whistle to begin with because Linda, who survived the first movie with David, apparently dropped it down the shaft before the base blew up. Yeah, I remember that. So. But I mean, 
<laughs> That's why I was like, but did maybe he, make he found a, a different one? one. Yeah, I was like, did he make a new one? Clearly, the walkie talkies are different. Yeah, so they're about he may a third have of the size of the made first movie's another one. So, whatever. I don't know. Yeah, there's a lot of problems with this movie. Um, it's basically like one of those things that would be be perfect for a group of people to just sit and laugh at all the plot holes and like stupid devices yeah, if, and like, like how you know big you the did like a mystery and... science theater type thing of this yes that's what this is clearly for yeah um but yeah i don't know i feel like we've covered most of everything yeah we i mean we already gave the ending away where <laughs> they do ward off the two monsters half human half monsters they apparently kill them Apparently but they're they dead, and then they walk away, and, and then, then they credits. just walk away, and then credit. Yeah, exactly. And so, that was it. Yep. The first one's better, but eh, not by much. I don't even know. Uh, the first one's better because Butch lives. <laughs> that's yeah. That's a good point. Um, the first one had better directing, I think, honestly, as well. Uh, this one not so great. There's just so many problems with it. Um, but let's get into the cast and crew really quickly here. Uh, Andrew Stevens. We're gonna see him a lot. In 1991 this guy has gone on to have a very prolific career he's still going strong in various different capacities mostly producing um, this was his directing debut he is uh, he's been acting for a long time prior to this he actually had a Golden Globe nomination back when they had a category for best acting debut uh, for the he earned that nomination for boys and company C uh, back in 1979 which uh, Arlie Ermey who is in here, and we didn't even mention him by name at all. Uh, he was the older grizzled guard, um, Vaughn. Arlie Ermey worked as an advisor on Boys and Company C, so I guess maybe they had some past uh, relationship from that. Who knows? He's gone on to, uh, Andrew Stevens has gone on to direct Night Eyes 3, Skateboard Kid 2, Virtual Combat, so, you know, very high-end stuff. Uh, he's the writer of Night Eyes 1, um, and he did the story for part two, which we'll see in 1991 Movie Rewind, and then also part three. There is also a Night Eyes 4, just in case anyone's curious about that. Um, I'm not going to go into too many of his credits because, again, we'll see him a whole bunch. He's in, as an actor, he's in Blood Chase, Night Eyes 2, Deadly Deception. Um, he's produced over 100 different things, including, uh, I'll, I'll give you one credit. Do you remember the movie Pop Star? Not the one with Andy Samberg. Oh, that that's what I was thinking of. So, <laughs> the no. one with Aaron Carter? The uh, Aaron Carter oh, star okay, vehicle? Okay, 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 okay. That, that's his. Oh, wow. He produced, uh, he produced star and also did an acting role. He was one of the professors in that movie. So that's the... You get an idea of the type of stuff he's going off of. Um, he also, like, writes books about how to make movies. So, you know... Okay. They'd probably be very helpful for someone who's trying to do stuff on the cheap... Yeah. You know, I, I could see, like, a, a growing, budding filmmaker trying to, you know, use his work to say, hey, this guy's done a whole bunch of stuff on a really good budget. He probably learned a lot from Roger Corman, who produced both of these movies. Stella Stevens, like I said, is his mom, played Kara, the older doctor. She's also going to be in uh, two 1991 movies, The Last Call, and also a movie called Mom. She had been on Santa Barbara and Flamingo Road. Um, she also had a Golden Globe win for Most Promising Newcomer Female back in 1960. Um, she's been in, like, Girls, Girls, Girls with Elvis Presley, Courtship of Eddie's Father, The Nutty Professor. She's also a Playboy Centerfold, which led to all those opportunities. So she's been involved in the business for a long, long time. Uh, Arlie Ermey, like I said, played Vaughn. Um, he was, you know, the voice of reason for the most part or whatever. He's, like, the big boss man of the, of the base. Um, I think everyone knows him for his Golden Globe-nominated performance in Full Metal Jacket. I'll also mention his Fangoria nomination, since we're talking about horror movies, because mm -hmm. he was in the 2003 remake of Texas Chainsaw Massacre. He plays Sarge in Toy Story. He was in Frighteners, uh, Seven. Um, he's also going to be in two more 1991 movies, True Identity and also Toy Soldiers. Uh, Kyle, who <laughs> you didn't know who... Yeah. Like, everyone's, like, all confusing, so it's tough to know. Uh, if you're watching this on YouTube, because we have a YouTube channel now, like, I'll have screenshots as I go through all this stuff. Uh, Kyle... It was played by Chick Venera, um, who I think we probably know him best for playing uh, Pesto the Pigeon in Animaniacs. 
you know that that Godfathers or the Goodfellas ripoff that mm-hmm. they did with the three mm-hmm. pigeons. He was one of the. I think the he was voices? like the Joe Pesci like oh, one pesto. Okay. Um, he's also going to be in two 1991 movies, McBain and Runaway Father. Um, I won't go to, into too many. A lot of these people are going to be in 1991 movies, so I won't go into too many of these people. Uh, Claire Hoke played Ariel. She's going to be in Deadly Deception with Andrew Stevens later on. She was also in Cool World and a Don Henley music video. I found it interesting because her parents are Don Hoke, who was an MLB player for the Pirates and the Dodgers back in the 50s, and also a popular singer from the era of Jill Corey. Barbara Allen Woods, who played Sharon. This is her only 1991 movie. Oh, never mind. She's also in Delusion. Uh, <laughs> um, she played Deb Lee on One Tree Hill. And she was also on the Honey, I Shrunk the Kids TV series, which lasted 66 episodes. I had no I idea it lasted watched it. that long. It's, it's crazy to me. I found out she's the mom of Emily Allen Lind. And know. Natalie and Olivia Lind, who are all really successful TV actresses. I just know Emily the most because I've seen her. She's in like the Babysitter movie. She was in Dr. Sleep. Okay. She plays the younger girl in it, if you remember. Sort of. And then she's in the most recent Gossip Girl. That's yeah. That's how I know her. <laughs> yeah, I mean, I didn't write down most of the credits because I, you know, I wanted to sort of conserve space. That's and, what, when and I was looking these people up. Are... I was like, wait a second, I know these daughters of hers. Yeah, yeah. So Emily. So her daughters are. Emily, Natalie, and well known. Olivia are all really successful, actively working, have been on like long-running TV shows, all three of them have. Renee Jones played Robin. Uh, she will be in the 1991 movie Talking Dirty After Dark. Uh, she was also in L.A. Law for a bit. She was in Friday the 13th Part 6, but probably most people know her as Lexi Carver in Days of Our Lives, which she was in 1800 episodes of Wow! until she retired from acting in 2012. Uh, Lou Beatty Jr. played Ernie, who was the uh, the black guy who uh, got sick and killed early on. Um, he hasn't been in a whole lot of stuff. He has been in Dynasty. He's now finding uh, success with the role as Walter on A Million Little Things, which is currently still playing. Um, and he's also in a couple 1991 movies called Stop at Nothing and also Knight Rider 2000. We have a little bit of pedigree in this movie. I'm going to skip some of these people here. But we have uh, Dean Jones played Rafe, who was like the the other guy who was like I think he's the other guy who was attacking David, uh, okay. from the Scavengers. Yeah, I'm pretty sure that's who it is. Um, he's mostly behind the scenes. He does like you know, mostly makeup work. Uh, but he has done stuff for um, Star Trek Part Six. Guilty is charged and Wizards of the Demon Sword in terms of 1991 movies. He also worked on Slumber Party Massacre 3. I'll always take an opportunity to mention that franchise when I can. But he also has two Emmy wins for his makeup work on Star Trek Deep Space Nine, as well as five more nominations. So he's he's good on the makeup front, and he probably did a lot of that behind the scenes in this movie too. I actually did not look that up. I will also mention the music, which we didn't really touch touch on too much. It was kind of out of place. It kind of felt like it was... Yeah, it was very... It sounded very much like stock. Yeah, it sounded like a stock... Footage type music. That that would be accompanying like an epic, you know, like a Lawrence of Arabia type of a, you know, epic journey type of a movie. Just did not fully fit. Uh, But it was done by Terry Plumeri who will also do the 1991 movies Crackdown, Uncaged, Sometimes They Come Back, and Lower Level. He's mostly a jazz or classical musician, so but he also decided to do some film work later on uh, in his career, and this is one of them that he did. Uh, but the big person to mention in this movie is the cinematographer, because when I saw his credit in here, I'm like, really? That guy did this movie? Mm. So Janusz Kaminski is the cinematographer for The Terror Within 2, one of his very early credits. Um, He is an Oscar winner two times over. One for Schindler's List, which came out only two years later. So from two years in being in the industry, he went from this... He just learned a lot, or ...to Schindler's List and basically became Steven Spielberg's right-hand man cinematographer. Um, So he won for for Schindler's List and then Saving, Saving Private Ryan. He's also been nominated for Amistad, uh, War Horse... Lincoln and Diving Bell and the Butterfly 
He'll also do the 1991 movies Wildflower, Pirates, and Cool as Ice. Mm. So I do not see what Steven Spielberg saw in him to give him that first job on Schindler's List, but it worked. (laughs) No awards to speak of, by the way. Uh, On to true crime and pop culture. So I do have a true crime. And I'm going to skip music and the TV because um, a lot of the music, like the top five and what was on TV, we talked about in Popcorn, which was last week. And that Popcorn was February 1st, 1991. And Bare Essentials, which is a couple of weeks ago, that was released January 8th, 1991. This is like right in the middle, January 18th. So everything was just pretty much the same. Sure. TV and music wise. So I'm going to talk about Terry Plumeri again, who did the music for the movie. And he was found on the early morning of April 1st, 2016. Police responded to a well-being check, check at Plumeri's home in Dunnellan, Florida. Dunnellan is D-U-N-N-E-L-L-O-N. I'm assuming it's Dunnellan. Sure. I don't know. Officers found him dead with signs of extensive upper body trauma. Early speculation was that his death was a result of a home invasion possibly linked to a series of crimes in the Citrus County, Florida area, and it was subsequently discovered that he was murdered by burglars. And I got this information from a couple of articles. One was for CBS News and the other one was ABC News. And that's all they gave was just saying that his body was found April 1st, 2016 in his home. It was from burglars. And then I was like, well, what happened to the burglars? Mm -hmm. And the first article I found was from the Daily Freeman, which we can put this all on the website. This article was published on March 2017. And this is going to be a trigger warning, content warning suicide and then talking about how Terry Plumeri actually died like the actual trauma that he received okay so, so giving, if you're squeamish about that yeah if you're squeamish the next time stamp. yeah you can yeah go to the next timestamp or just skip a couple minutes so this article is just entitled Florida resident kills himself in jail while awaiting murder trials. So there's multiples that this guy did. So Darren Decker, who was 42 at the time, died a few days earlier that when this article was published. So it was March 2017 in the afternoon in Citrus County Detention Center. It, a, it was a, It's a private jail in Lakanto, Florida. He was accused of killing two people in Florida and it's found in the in the beginning this article was updated a couple months later they just said that his body was found Mm -hmm. a few months later they ruled it as a suicide decker was indicted for first degree murder in may of 2016 so a month after plumeri died but he was decker was indicted for a january 2016 death of Someone by the name of Tamara Bedenbaugh. She was 57. She lived in Ocala, Florida. She was killed during a home invasion. So he robbed her house, killed her, took her jewelry and cash. And then in December of 2016, Decker was indicted again by the Citrus County, Florida authorities for first-degree murder of Terry Plumeri and armed burglary in connection with, you know, Terry Plumeri's death on March 31st, 2016. Decker faced the possibility of the death penalty in both cases and also for, you know, armed burglary. Decker had a partner in crime with this, and it was his partner, Jessica Baker, She's also from Ocala, Florida. 
and she was indicted December 20th, 1996, or 2016, for first-degree murder of Plumeri and also armed robbery. And she is was facing life in prison if convicted, and then also she faces prison for burglary in the other case of Tamara Badenbaugh from January of 2016. The Florida authorities said in May of 2016 that Decker and Baker also were suspects in as many as 60 burglaries in that state, in the state of Florida. The burglaries come to be known as the, quote, pillowcase burglaries because of the crimes involved placing stolen items in pillowcases. Decker had a lengthy rap sheet all over, I just all over, I don't know Florida at all <laughs> besides going to Orlando. Mm. So he has a huge rap sheet in Ulster County, Florida, that includes numerous arrests for crimes ranging from passing bad checks to grand larceny. And then he spent time in the Ulster County jail as far back as 1991. I found another article. It's chronicleonline.com. It's underneath the crimes and courts section, which is really interesting. This was an article that was published in April of 2018. So a couple years later, you know, she probably, I mean, they were probably going into trial. This starts out as circuit judge Rick Howard states that Jessica Baker could have easily turned her cohort, Darren Decker, over to police as his murderous home burglary spree ran rampant in Florida. But Baker didn't, and that's why Howard's sentence, the 46-year-old Ocala woman, to 50 years in prison for her role in the 2016 home invasion and murder of Terry Plumeri and nine other home burglaries from Marion County, Florida. Hmm. This is a quote from the judge stating that she was the driver all she had to do was drive off find a cop and say enough and she but she didn't baker's 50-year punishment will be served concurrently with the 30-year prison term a circuit judge out of sumter county florida handed her in january of 2018 on five related felony cases in accordance with baker's plea deal howard could not sentence Baker, who had already pled guilty to her charges, to more prison time. A verdict was never given to Decker, who was never given to Decker, who was found dead in his jail cell in 2017. So we do find out that he was hanging by his bed sheets. That's how Decker killed himself. Baker's attorney, who is Charles Vaughn, asked for Howard to give her client more lenient sentence because Decker was forcing her to be his accomplice and she was just the driver. So he, Decker was the one that would go in the house, do the burglarizing and leave until he started killing people. And in this article, I did find out how Plumeri died and it is said that during trial, it was re- released that Plumeri was stabbed almost 90 times, hmm. including 10 to his head with a screwdriver. Oh God. But the actual cause of death of Plumeri was asphyxiation, and that was because his mouth was duct taped. Pure malicious. Yeah. Sp- I, don't, I don't know if it's spite or whatever, but like it wasn't like, you know. Stab- being stabbed. It wasn't, a, yeah, by, just with like a resisting. screwdriver. Yeah, I mean... He, he died. He was already dead because he died from asphyxiation. So I mean, Decker probably came in, slapped tape on his mouth immediately, ransacked his house, and then all of a sudden, like, stabbed him a bunch of times, and then left. Yeah. But I mean, and then there was also something in the article calling Decker like the, um, the judge called him a coward because he killed himself. Moving on to TV. Like I said before, the TV was... I mean, January 18th, 1991 was a Friday, so it was just a typical TGIF lineup, and there was nothing new, no new interesting TV shows to report. Yeah, even though this is directed video, it still came out on a Friday, which isn't really the norm these days. Those typically happen on Tuesdays, but, um, you know, we cover the Friday stuff a lot. (laughs) Yeah. 
we don't have a new day's worth of TV to talk about, unfortunately, yet. Yeah, so we, uh, I was checking up to see what was on Saturday and to see if there was an SNL, and there was an SNL, and we watched the, it was season 16, episode 11, premiered January 19th, 1991, and it had Sting as the host and musical guest. We didn't, if you watch it on Peacock, <laughs> you, you didn't see any of his performances, but he did no. perform three songs, All This Time, Mad About You, and then Purple Haze. So I guess it was a remake of Jimi Hendrix's Purple Haze. I guess so. Yeah, I don't really remember from the original airing. I know I've seen the episode. I remember, because when we were watching it, I was like, oh, I remember this episode because of some of the skits that we saw. Yeah, so the, what's on Peacock is only about a half hour long. Um, obviously, with commercials, things get, you know, reduced. But when you take out three musical acts, and then I, from my listing, one, two, three, four, five, possibly six sketches, mm. um, it gets, yeah. Reduced. Yeah. And then we only see one sketch where Sting is... Yeah, he's in one. Yeah, he only appears in one sketch. And I don't know... I guess he says a couple words. Yeah. So, uh, also, this January 19th, 1991, is the premiere of one, the Richmeister, the Making Copies. Yeah. Rob Schneider's signature sketch. So, Robin Schneider's... Sketch. Yeah, signature sketch that probably got him cast in... Necessary Roughness. In Necessary Roughness. Uh-huh. And then also the debut of Jack Handy's Deep Thoughts. Which is surprising to me that it happened, like... What, like mid-season? Yeah, this is the 11th episode. Yeah. I mean, it was probably... This is January 19th, so yeah, th- well no, because January, tw- they had an episode on January 12th, so you know how they make their Christmas break? Mm-hmm. It was, it was the second episode after the Christmas break. And there's a lot they... of Jack Handy in this, that's on yeah. Peacock even. There was, I wrote them all down, I don't know, there was four of them, and then there was a skit, the Hammer skit, which, I don't, they're all, they all make <laughs> me laugh. Mm-hmm. The first skit that we saw was... The British toothpaste. No, the first one was the Wayne's World. Oh, yeah. Okay, because that's the beginning. Yeah, they had the, the cold, cold open. Because yeah, they're so talking that's... about the uh, Desert Storm yeah. uh, invasion that's yeah. very, very much you know in the forefront of the news at that time. And evidently, <laughs> something I guess I kind of like learned from this is that this is, in essence, the start of Wolf Blitzer's run on CNN because they do like a little jab at like who has the best name and who has the worst mm. name of the coverage. And the worst name's like... One of the worst name was Wolf Blitzer because they're like, you know, this is clearly a made up name. Mm-hmm. Um, and and a lot of the audience reacted in such a way that they had not heard of that person before. Yeah. So I think it's sort of like where he came into the uh, the newsroom and became a thing. Um, the monologue was missing, so you have the opening theme song as always, but then the monologue from Sting is completely so, missing. So yeah, I wonder because he probably sang yeah, during that's, it. Yeah, that's I was like he was probably singing in it, so we didn't even see a monologue. It was just really weird because usually we do see a monologue. Yeah, yeah, usually they keep those in. Um, and then yeah, the British toothpaste Headley and Weish. Yes. Um, where yeah, the joke is. It's sugar, basically. Yeah, there, there's sugar in there, and it's like, you don't have to brush your teeth once a week, but you might want to. Like, yeah, mm-hmm. just really hammering on the British for bad dental care. Then there's two sketches that were missing. Elevator fans, which is the one that I remember the most from this, mm. uh, where it's Dana Carvey and Kevin Nealon in an elevator with Sting. Okay. And, oh, um, okay. you know, they're talking about how big of a fan they are of his Mm -hmm. and then they like you know start singing his songs under their breath and like you know okay yeah like that type of thing and you know the whole sketches sting is very awkward you know like it's all very awkward and stings like trying to be very complacent like yep that's that's the song that's Mm -hmm. that's how it goes you got it like it's that type of thing um and then there's also a sinatra group sketch uh where phil hartman would have played Frank Sinatra, but that was missing from the episode as well. I guess anything with singing, they just take out. Yeah. You know what I noticed? Because later on they have a coffee talk sketch. And at the end, 
they replaced the music, I think, because you can see Mike Meyer as uh, Mike Myers as um, Paul, Baldwin. Paul Baldwin singing along with "Start Spreading the News," which is clearly not playing on the Peacock episode. So yeah. I think they replaced that um, on the repeat, but then music. something in the Sinatra group episode part um, probably couldn't be cleared. I hate that. I hate. I hate the entertainment rights thing anyway uh you go into the deep thoughts uh you got the first rich meister you got weekend update with david spade uh doing a little sketch in there too um you got the bad idea jeans commercial which Mm -hmm. i think still holds up Mm -hmm. i think it's pretty good and then there's some frankenstein's monster sketch which is missing from this no idea what that would have been about anymore uh then you have jack handy's hammer story coffee talk um and then something called Bleak Poetry, which is also missing. Uh, but yeah, sprinkled in there is like four different deep thoughts. And then you have this long, uh, well, you know, normal size sketch of Jack Handy uh, telling a story about his childhood. Which I've never seen because I've only just, when I know about Jack Handy, it's just his deep thoughts. I didn't know they did skits of like his stories. But... Yeah, I mean, I knew he wrote other sketches. Yeah, I know not, that, but you know, I like don't know. Or whatever. Yeah. Um, but... But yeah, like, like a it's like a, a weird rendition too. of a story as if he was a kid. Yeah, I think they did something like that in the later days because you know how he was still with the SNL like when the Will Ferrell crew started to come in, mm. and so they started to do not deep thoughts, but they tried to do like short stories by Jack Handy type of a thing. Um, this was sort of like a precursor to that. But it had such a weird introduction to it. I don't know. Like, they had, like, you know, like, the, the big text of, like, this is how it hap. And then the, uh-huh. the happened. Um, but it's still, it, it's really funny. Watch watch the Peacock, Peacock episode for, for that. I mean, I, I don't know if we can get YouTube of it, but if we can, we can put it on the website. But if not... That, I mean, we could only put like a couple. Hilarious. I don't yeah, know. we could probably put like a couple stills, but I, I don't know yeah. if it's available on YouTube at all. SNL might have it. We can look. And we can probably put all of his deep thoughts on the website because I found memes of those. Mm. Move on to rankings and ratings. Um, on your one to five star scale, where would you put the terror within two? This is a one. <laughs> what a surprise! Um, I, I think this is probably now. This is now your number one worst my number over one Kiss Before worst Dying movie. Yes, I think I would rather watch Kiss Before Dying than over this. That's interesting. But I would only watch this because Butch is in it. <laughs> well, we'll wait until Night Eyes two when we get to okay. see Butch again. Um, we get to see what happens with Butch in that time. Um, on my zero to four star scale, I think I'm actually going to put it at a one star. So I know it's a terrible movie, but I think just I have a soft spot for schlock like this. I don't know, like it's it's appealing to me. I know it's bad, but like part of what I enjoy about these movies is the ability to rip them apart. And so like I appreciate like the independent filmmaking spirit of it and all that kind of stuff. So I'm going to say it's a one. Like it's entertaining enough that like yes, it was dumb, but it held my attention probably because it was so dumb. <laughs> okay. <laughs> and like yeah, it had some like interesting things and if it, it, yeah, it could have been better. But anyway, I'm going to give it a 1 out of 4. Um everything's worth watching once would you watch this again? No. Me either, uh, but I'm definitely interested to see if what else there was like happens a mystery with Andrew science Stevens' theater, catalog. Yeah, if there was a Mystery Science Theater 3000 making fun of this movie, sure. Yeah, I, I could also see yeah some of the other podcasts that focus on bad movies, like How Did This Yeah, like made. a Riff Tracks, would, um, yeah, anything you know, like that. You know, maybe to watch it again, just kind of refresh the memory, but... Because I would want to see them rip apart that whole sperm and going to the egg scene. Because that really blew my mind. Yeah. (laughs) That was the dumbest. (laughs) And there are so many things wrong with this movie. And that's what makes it fun to me. Um, If you out there want to watch The Terror Within 2, as of this recording in September 2021, it's available on Tubi, Shout Factory TV, 
digital rental, VHS, or DVD, as always, check your local listings. As for us, you can listen to us on all your major podcasting platforms. Please remember to rate, review, subscribe, and tell your friends. You can email us at 1991movierewind at gmail.com. You can follow us on Twitter, Instagram, Facebook, and Letterboxd. Just search 1991 Movie Rewind or go to 1991movierewind.com for the full list of movies along with show notes and more. Next week, <laughs> oh God, we're, we're continuing our horror months. We're finishing it out with The Unborn. So we're going to more demon babies, I guess. Yeah, I guess we had a theme that we didn't <laughs> know about. Inadvertently, yeah. That's also available on Tubi, Digital Rental, VHS, and DVD. We'll see you then. Thanks. <laughs>